I'm Sarah. In the next few videos, I'm going to go over the city search functionality that I built for my Android app. The first video focuses on setting up, using, and closing Ktour's HTTP client to get a list of cities. If you're new to my channel, it might be helpful to check out my previous videos to see how we got here, but it's really not required to follow along. All of the code for this is out on GitHub in a branch called Ktour Client App Scoped. The Ktour API is also in Git in a branch called City Search Details. Both of these links are in the video description. Here are some quick tips before we get started. If you're using an emulator, you can use 10.0.2.2 on port 8080 to connect to the Ktour API. This maps to 127, your local address, if that's what you're running the Ktour API on. To use your phone over Wi-Fi, you'll need to use your development server's network address instead, which could be something like 192.168.0.5. Just make sure that you configure the Ktour API to actually run on this address too, instead of your local address. I use environment variables and Android build config properties to handle all of this for me. Check out my previous videos for more information. To set things up, first, in your Android manifest file, make sure to add internet permissions. Next, this is really important, add uses clear text traffic and set it to true. If you don't set this, you'll get an error that says clear text HTTP traffic to 127 is not permitted. By setting this to true, we can communicate with our Ktour API over HTTP. To use data classes with our API, we'll need to add support for serialization. So in your project Gradle file, make sure to add the serialization plugin. And then in your module, make sure to initialize the Kotlin serialization plugin. And then finally, in your module Gradle file, add the Ktour client dependencies for the core Ktour HTTP client functionality, and then the engine. So to process network requests, Ktour client supports various engines like Apache, CIO, and iOS. In our case, our engine is Android. Next, add content negotiation and serialization to support our data classes. And then finally, add the logging dependency so we can debug our requests and responses. I'll show you how this works later on. To understand how my setup works, let's take a look at the Ktour API response first. When it's successful, it returns the following city data. The user with the app is the record that's associated with the API key from the request header, which in my case is the city Android app. If it's not successful, it returns the following JSON error. We'll use this later on to implement global error handling. My app serializes the city data response to the city DTO class, which is marked as serializable. And these are all the fields that come back from the Ktour API. I also have a data class for the user with app. And finally, I have a data class for the app errors, which stores the code and the message that comes back from the Ktour API. And all of these classes are combined in the city API response and this mirrors the JSON response from the Ktour API. So before we set up the module for Hilt and build the client, let's take a look at Ktour's docs first. Here, there are a few things to consider. So for starters, creating the HTTP client is not a cheap operation. Ktour recommends that we close the client when we're done, and calling close prohibits new requests. Since creating the client is expensive, let's go ahead and scope the client to the application and create it as a singleton. Now, if you'd like, you can figure the various engine properties like timeouts and proxies, or you can just leave this whole thing out and use the defaults. Next, to enable default validation and global error handling, I set expect success to true and this allows me to capture exceptions for non-200 responses. Next, I install the logging plugin. I override the log function so that when it's called, 
I write the message out to Logcat with the HTTP client tag. This gives me tons of useful information about my requests and responses. I can easily check and validate my query URLs. And I can also get detailed information about my responses. Then finally, I install the content negotiation plugin. Here, we have lots of JSON serialization settings that we can provide. And to learn more about this, I recommend that you just browse for the JSON KT file from Android Studio and look at the different options, or you can learn more on KTOR's website. In my app, I create a city API service that injects the HTTP client. And it also defines some key endpoints and other constants for my API. Ketor makes it really easy to use get, post, and other built-in request methods to build your requests. To get a list of cities by name, I pass in the search text, and I add it as a query parameter. I also add my API key in the header. It's just as easy to use bearer authentication. In my get user function, which is part of my Google OneTap sign-in process, I simply call bearer auth to add my JWT to the header. Need to add a path parameter? This is really easy too. Just use append path segments for endpoints like user slash ID. For each request, I implement some global error handling that's based on the KTOR API response type. I've already talked about this in a previous video, so here I'll just give a quick recap. My KTOR API returns the same JSON format for both successful and failed requests. This JSON matches the city API response data class. Because of this, I can parse the KTOR exception message and convert it to a city API response data class. I do this by extracting the text contents from the KTOR exception. I'll show you how this works in the next slide. To city API error takes a generic object which in this case is the city API response. It uses two error response that we saw on the previous slide to parse the KTOR error message, and then it returns as a service result error. This gives us access to the error code and the error message. And then I can use these messages in a snack bar in my app. So based on the KTOR docs, we might want to close our client when the activity is destroyed. But because of the way that we've scoped the client to our app, closing the client can actually cause a lot of issues and bugs. For starters, we can't always guarantee that on destroy will be called. And second, let's take a look at the close function. So not only does it close the plugins and the engine, but it also calls Client job complete. Client job is a completable job. So what happens when complete is called is all of the job's children complete, and then the job transitions into the completed state. Next, let's try to close the client when the activity is destroyed. If we check the logs, here we can see that I've created the HTTP client. It has a singleton ID of ED, 49C37. Now, when we use retrofit, we can always guarantee that our request is running on a background thread. But for HTTP client, we need to specify this explicitly. So here, I'm also making sure that my request is running on the dispatchers.io thread, which I specify in my view model. Now, I rotate my phone. In the logs, we can see that my activity is destroyed and the HTTP client is closed. With my activity recreated and my phone still rotated, I make another request. The log prints out our HTTP client ID, which hasn't changed at all, but now I get an error and it says that the coroutine was canceled. The exact error is request failed with the exceptions Kotlin coroutines job cancellation exception, parent job is completed. This makes total sense because we've scoped our client to the app and our singleton outlives the activity. And once we call close on HTTP client, 
were prohibited from making new requests. So what's the best way to close the client? I'm not really sure what's considered best practice in this scenario, but here are my thoughts. First of all, I think it's completely safe to just not call close at all, and instead, just let Android handle cleaning things up when the app is destroyed. If Android kills our singleton behind the scenes, it's fine because Hilt will take over and just recreate it. But second of all, and more importantly, what if you really need to call close? There might be times when you have to do this. For example, you need to explicitly free up resources, or maybe you have a banking app and you want to make 100% sure that every single request completes. Now, you could play around with scoping the client to the activity, but remember, creating the client isn't cheap, and also that might give us scoping issues if we need to inject the client into our longer-lived repositories and view models. That's okay, though. This isn't a problem. Here's a different and possibly better way to set things up. First, in the City API service, remove the injected client and create a variable in the companion object that holds our client. Next, add a function to create the client if it's null, and then return the client that we've created as a variable. Then, create a public close function that we can call from our repo. And this basically closes the client in the proper way and then sets it to null so it can be recreated properly when we need it. Now, in the request functions, just call client as a function invocation. Here, we don't have to worry about it being null because it will just get recreated if it is. For this implementation, I reworked the City API service help module. So here, I use binds instead of provides. And notice we don't have to inject the client anymore. We can just go ahead and create the service. In my search view model, I add a function to close the client. I also added an onCleared function that will clean things up if the view model is destroyed. And then finally, in my search composable, I add a disposable effect to call view model close. So let's see what the logs say now when we run this. When I start typing, the client is created and I get an ID of E3CA1D4. Now, if I navigate back to home, the client is closed successfully. And I can go back to search and my state is still retained. I press backspace to get pH for my search. With the new keystrokes, my client is recreated with the new ID. And that's pretty much it. We didn't get any errors with this implementation and everything seems to be working well. If users put the app in the background, the client stays alive until the composable is actually destroyed. The code for this implementation is in a branch called Ktor Client Closable. I'm really happy with the way this worked out and I might switch over to this pattern going forward, but I really haven't tested it thoroughly yet. Finally, just one more thing to mention about closing the client. If you only need to run one request, for example, maybe in a background service and a job that doesn't need to preserve the client, Ktor also provides a use function. This automatically closes the client when the request completes. Just remember, don't use this if you've scoped the client to your app. Instead, just use the get, post, and other request functions that are available. Those are the basics of HTTP client. I realized that I didn't really go too far into my app's architecture. Feel free to explore this in the code and let me know if you have any questions. In the next video, I'll go over two different ways to integrate the search as you type functionality. Thanks for watching.